Welcome to our last uh, study for 2020. It might be a nice. This has been a nice part of 2020, but I'm I'm not uh, uh, I'm not sad. We'll uh, we'll we'll leave 2020 in the rearview mirror here anytime soon. But uh, let's begin with prayer. We're in the uh, this third week of uh, we're in the rose candle week of Advent, and kind of the uh, both Lent and Advent have their kind of bright pink. Uh, I call it pink, you know, the, the professionals call it rose, uh, uh, kind of this joy in, in the midst of the uh, seasons of repentance and, of course, for Advent, this season of preparation. But uh, we'll begin with uh, the colic for the day. We'll, we'll uh, continue our study of the gospel according to uh, Isaiah. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And as I would have it, I, I swear I don't, I don't plan these things. It just has turned out to be so remarkably uh, uh, right in line with our uh, march through the, uh, the church year as well. Even in the, in the, the collect here, this mention of the uh, light in the darkness of our hearts. That's going to be a huge theme today as we look at uh, Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 4. In fact, if you want to turn there, that'll be our uh, touch-off point. Matthew chapter 4, uh, and it, which is going to drive us back to Isaiah chapter 9, which is, uh, you've sung it in the Ungamak, you, uh, uh, the familiar words from uh, uh, Christmas readings, uh, the, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. Uh, but great on these themes of light, and darkness, and light coming into uh, uh, the gloom and the darkness. But if you're there at Matthew chapter 4, and just kind of remembering where, uh, where we've been in Matthew already, you've got the, uh, the you know, infancy narratives of Jesus, you know, the birth, the visit of the wise men, uh, the flight into Egypt, uh, the slaughter of the innocents, uh, a, uh, a Jesus returning to Nazareth, where at least in his childhood he is growing up, then, of course, we had John the Baptist preparing the way and Isaiah pointing directly to John these uh, 700 years later. And then uh, Jesus uh, uh, is baptized in chapter 3. He is uh, immediately after his baptism, he goes straight into the wilderness in the, uh, uh, the 40 days of temptation, which now brings us to where we are uh, today and where, we'll, where that will take us in the uh, the gospel uh, according to Isaiah. But this is kind of the, the uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 and following. And this is kind of the, the last passage of uh, Matthew's overall introduction, these first three and a half uh, chapters uh, to the ministry of Jesus. Uh, the, the main body of the gospel where it kind of gets into it, where Jesus, uh, you can kind of see verse 17 of chapter 4, where, where uh, it says, uh, from that time Jesus began to preach. So now he's now he's into it. You know, he's going to call his first disciples right after that. But you'll notice that Jesus preaches the very same thing that John the Baptist was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now Jesus has literally come to that water and uh, filled that water that uh, uh, John, the, the, the crowds were coming to, uh, to John to repent of their sins and now the one whom, to whom he's been pointing, as Isaiah told us long before, uh, he has come. And uh, uh, could someone read Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through uh, 16? And this will, you'll get us into the uh, uh, Matthew using Isaiah. Veronica, would you mind closing that door for us, please? I know the, I think the kids are going to be in there. And... Mine, I thought I was in trouble. Oh, no. <laughs> you stop knitting. <laughs> And you can, even, you can even stay with us on this side of the door. <laughs> but could someone read Matthew chapter 4, beginning verse 12 through uh, verse 16? When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the, death of, of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Now, thank you, John. This is, now, this may not seem, I mean, what's the, the thrust of this? It's basically Jesus is moving. 
And, and while that doesn't seem all uh, earth uh, shaking to us. It really, I mean, Matthew is actually making the point of uh, 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 kind of recording this, this final event, even if it doesn't seem all that glamorous to us. I mean, boy, Jesus, uh, you know, he had, uh, he's in Galilee, so you, you always have your maps out here. You've got your Galilee eyes on here. You've got your Nazareth here. Capernaum is up there by the, uh, here's the Sea of Galilee here. Uh, and this is special, boy, today, I mean, you, you've heard me dwell upon how important maps are. Boy, maps are going to pull the New Testament and the Old Testament together as we kind of overlay the, the places of the Old Testament tribes. Because that's where Jesus is in action now. In fact, it's even mentioned that uh, the, the land of Zebulun, that was an actual land. Here's a, another little map here. Of the, we've seen this before. You know, the, the 12 tribes, well, the 11 tribes and all their little areas here in the Old Testament. You know, you had Judah down here with Jerusalem. But up here, here's Zebulun. Here's Naphtali. Here's Manasseh, or part of Manasseh over there. There's another part from Manasseh here. But, uh, and here's the Sea of Galilee. So you can kind of see in, in Galilee in the time of Jesus is going to be just like... Uh, uh, just like Matthew records from Isaiah. Zebulun, used to, his tribe used to live there. Naphtali used to live there. And so having that, I mean, it really kind of uh, makes more vivid, especially when you understand what kind of military conquesting was going on there. When the, uh, when the Assyrians, way back when, when they were the big kids on the block, and back a long time ago, 722 B.C., when they kind of sweep through and destroy make no more the, the northern kingdom, what we call Israel at that time. Remember, the southern kingdom was Judah, the northern kingdom was Israel. It's always kind of difficult to, to uh, make sure we got the right context for the names there. But, uh, uh, I mean, Matthew, in chapter 4 here, uh, uh, talks about this move. Mark talks about it. Luke talks about it. Uh, they, they at least uh, kind of acknowledge it. But Matthew says, this move... When Jesus goes from Nazareth to uh, 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 living by now Capernaum by the sea, the Sea of Galilee, uh, in the territory of, you know, the old, old Testament territory, the tribal lands of Zebulun and Naphtali, these sons of Jacob, this is their tribal lands. So th this actually fulfills what the prophet Isaiah had spoken. So Matthew kind of makes a big deal about this, that Jesus' move is a fulfillment of, you know, changing his kind of Galilean residence from Nazareth, where he had been, where he grew, grew, grew up with uh, 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 Mary and Joseph there, his childhood more associated there, where, the, where the, uh, 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 his hometown synagogue was, and moves to, uh, uh, to Galilee and the location here, the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So, you know, Matthew recognizes the old tribal lands, but boy, those had long ago been wiped out. The foreigners came in, the Assyrians came in. They took, you know, what happened to the people that lived, what happened to the Israelites that lived up in that region after the Assyrians came? They got carried away. To where? Babylon. Yeah, I mean, they go into captivity. So the, the subtext here is that Jesus is now in this area, which had been the first to go. The first, you know, you know when, the, when the armies are sweeping in from the north, you know, they're a little bit more protected down here in the south. Judah goes later. They're, they become uh, exiles. They're deported later. But, uh, yeah, up there in Zebulun and Naphtali, you'd, you'd bet that they'd be the first ones that had the, uh, their homes destroyed as the Assyrian military kind of swept through and uh, killed some people, destroyed lots of things, and took other folks into captivity. Yes, Kay? My archaeological Bible has a reference saying that when those Assyrians took away the captives, the inhabitants were a mixed race of Jews and pagans. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, it's the northern reaches of the promised land, the land that God had carved out and gave to them, which they were, of course, I mean, going back to all our Old Testament history, where they were kind of slow conquering. Remember, it takes them you know, 40 years just to get out of the wilderness to cross uh, Jericho, and then uh, they have a couple of victories there, and then things kind of slow down again. And it's finally, you know, when David is able to have the united kingdom around the year, uh, uh, what about uh, 1100 or so uh, BC? Am I getting that right? 1000 BC, yeah. And uh, 
Uh, uh, but it, so, uh, I mean, this is actually a rather large quotation that Matthew uses from Isaiah. And you've got the whole picture here, knowing that, uh, and again, this is why our maps are, are precious. Uh, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, you can see it on the map. The way of the sea, and that would be the Sea of Galilee, uh, beyond the Jordan, and of course, you know, this is the Jordan. Let me put the other map in there, the, since we're in the New Testament here. So again, here, this is where Zebulun and Naphtali were, now it's, now it's Galilee in the New Testament. Here's the Sea of Galilee, here's the River Jordan. And listen to the, the description, because it would be the, the reference point would be, boy, these people who had, who had seen the, the, the loss of everything, the loss of their nation, taken captive, deported, away from the land. And yet, you know, this kind of a, a glimmer of hope as they're able, they're, they're actually going to return. And they're actually going to, you know, come back to their homes and, and they, they kind of trace out the, the road that would have come back down from, uh, you know, here's uh, when you're, you know, Assyria or the Babylonian uh, captivity's over here. They make the, the grand sweep here. Here's Damascus. It's still there. Uh, I don't have a map that has the kind of the ancient roads, but they're talking about that here. It's, the, uh, it's kind of a southwesterly route that the exiles would have been taking from out of their exile and uh, you know, captivity, now back to, oh my gosh, this could never happen in history, but it actually happens in history. It's so extraordinary that we almost uh, 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 don't think of it as, you know, we kind of take it for granted, but you know, God is setting the stage for this, for Jesus, who now from Nazareth moves to, to Capernaum there, this region where many of his miracles are going to take place. I mean, he's, yes, he's gonna spend his, a lot of time uh, uh, in Jerusalem, and the passion is going to take place there. And we know that he has encounters through Samaria, and uh, uh, he's also been up by uh, you know, Tyre and Sidon up there, and the Syrophoenician woman. But uh, these are why our maps are so important. But these exiles in the time of Isaiah, or that Isaiah was saying, hey, you're going to actually come back. It looks like the end of the world because of your, your uh, blasphemy and your unbelief and your idol worship in the temple that God destroyed the land and put you into captivity in order that he might yet still keep his promise and bring you out of that captivity. And then, you know, through that southwesterly direction from Damascus, by way of the sea, by the Jordan, you're going to get to go back and live there again, which was just you know, mind-blowingly unheard of. But Isaiah, this is kind of a, like the short-term fulfillment that Isaiah is preaching to these returning folks who are, you know, who, who are coming out of this darkness and now they're back home. My gosh, we, we get to dwell in the land again. It's like the light has come on. And uh, uh, the people dwelling in darkness, in captivity, that's kind of the first reference point here, uh, have seen a great light. Uh, and for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, you know, in captivity after the destruction of war and the desolation there, boy, a light has dawned. So there's the kind of short fulfillment, meaning, hey, you're going to come home. You're going to come out of your exile. But what Matthew is most certainly using Isaiah to say, who is this light? Obviously, Jesus. Here's the beginning of his, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the initiating point of the, the public ministry, as Matthew tells it. Go ahead and turn to... Uh, Say, Pastor, what, what is the uh, Galilee of the Gentiles? The, I mean, this is the... Here's the, the region, as uh, uh, Kathy mentioned. This, this, is, this place had a kind of a, a bad reputation simply because these are the, folks, the first folks to kind of be destroyed when the, uh, the, the nations came in, when the Gentiles came in, the Assyrians, they're the foreigners, they're the not God's people. And so there was a lot of, you know, as, as kind of the borderland, uh, it wasn't, uh, while well, it was supposed to be tribal lands for Zebulun and Naphtali because of their kind of inviting in uh, uh, and, and, and not remaining separate and distinct from the other nations, but actually almost inviting them in, having alliances with them until they got conquered by them that this is the, it's Galilee, but it's, it's the Gentiles. You know, you have a huge population of not God's people there, which is another why, reason why you had, you know, kind of a little dirty or a darker reputation than, uh, oh yeah, Jerusalem, you know, the, the holy city, you know, the, the temple, the rebuilt temples there. But, you know, the further you get away from uh, uh, the center point and, and go further up north, 
You know, that's, that's Gentile land, and the Jews, uh, by their own understanding and by their misunderstanding, we'll actually talk about this quite a bit, because you're going to see exactly how the Gentiles figure in God's salvation of the world. Yeah? Yes, this, this says on that uh, because they were impoverished people and they yeah. were Gentile, the um, southern Jews of pure blood... So they the thought, Orthodox yeah. The Orthodox tradition despised them, but yet because they were so impoverished, they were more eager to welcome the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. That's And, and the same thing with, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, Samaria as being, you know, uh, why the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, we're kind of used to hearing it, but my gosh, when Jesus tells that parable... The idea that you'd have a, a Samaritan who's good and who does this marvelous, compassionate, you know, from his guts loving thing of this guy who gets beat up, you know, coming uh, uh, through uh, uh, to Jericho. I mean, oh my gosh, it's unheard of. Samaritans are, are scummy. They're dirtbags. They're not full part members of the family. They're, you know, they had let uh, all these other influences happen that uh, were part of their, you know, decay and becoming decrepit. They were not pure and good as, you know, again, kind of the closer you got to Jerusalem and the, the power base and everything there, that, uh, and again, Judah, the, 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 uh, uh, the southern kingdom, they had been conquered as well, but they just got conquered later. I don't know if that's, you know, worth bragging about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got destroyed by the enemy as well. It just took, took, took them longer to get to us. You know, they, they were able to conquer you guys first, so were superior to, to you. And that's but, where all the priests and Pharisees were. were yeah, well, they would come from different regions, I mean, because the Levites were, but sp were sprinkled, but they would do their service, certainly at the temple. So but it was the better place? But uh, let, let's go to Isaiah chapter 9, because this is where Matthew points us. This is where Matthew is quoting. And, uh, and remember, uh, we've already spent a little bit of time, uh, well, We've spent quite a bit of time in a couple different places already. But keeping in the back of your mind, Isaiah 7, verse 14, uh, another discussion about a, a child. Here's the, the sign that, that the Lord said to Ahaz, hey, ask for a sign. Ask anything. Uh, I, will, I, will, uh, I will make good on it. And of course, Ahaz says, no, no, no. And then the Lord God says, you know. You know, you're tiring me out, my friend. I am going to give you a sign. And here's the sign. A virgin will conceive and bear a child. And here's his name. God with us. The, the, the promise of the child. The continuing promise of the, the seed who is going to come. This kind of mysterious seed who has no human father, but a, a virgin as a mother. But that idea of the child, which is then again picked up, and in some other places too, where sometimes, you know, Mike, you had asked about this a couple of weeks ago, because uh, we've heard from, you know, Isaiah's son, who was that, who was it, Maher, uh, Beshar, I can't I have to look uh, at the name here, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, back in Isaiah 7, you know, when Isaiah's son is right there with a Sheer Jashub, and then there's another son of Isaiah. And last week in Isaiah chapter 11, we uh, got the whiffs again of this, you know, and a little child shall lead them. So there's this whole idea of the child or the, the children and trying to sort that out. Which one is Isaiah's actual kids with, with uh, Isaiah's wife, the prophetess? And which is the way this one is spoken of? This guy's this child that's born, this son that's given He's spoken of differently than, you know, your child or my child. This one is the mighty God. You know, the, the mind, you know, is excited by the fact that, you know, who is this one? This, this is the Messiah. This is the promised one. The, 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 uh, the, the promise keeps on getting, uh, you know, finer details. Uh, and then we can uh, trace them to real history to see, ah, and, and here is Jesus then, those, uh, that, you know, seven, eight hundred years later, who himself now, Back in this very region, you know, grows up in Nazareth there, which is part of Galilee. This not so great, you know, what good could come from Nazareth and all that stuff. And as Kathy said, you know, the further you were away from the hub there, the, uh, the, the lesser uh, you were considered and probably the, the poorer you were. So there's a, kind of a pecking order going on there. But looking at the very end of Isaiah chapter 8, I mean, even the very last verse, it says, uh, uh, when it's... Uh, 
Uh, speaking again of the, just the onslaught of the Assyrians, the loss of all things, your nation is going away. Repent. Uh, they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Wouldn't that be a great way to end a sermon on Sunday? Okay, bye, see you next week. I mean, it's, you know, Isaiah 8 ends with this absolute, you know, uh, the light has turned off. The people have been taken away. Yeah, life is over. And then the transition to the very beginning of Isaiah chapter 9. Could someone read, uh, and we'll, we'll be echoing what we already read from the gospel according to St. Matthew here, but uh, could someone read verses 1 through 5 of Isaiah chapter 9? And listen for that language of you know, bleakness, the gloominess, and, and what's happening to that place that was you know, uh, filled with anxiety and distress and darkness. Uh, something has happened. The best thing possible is promised. And if God has promised it, it is going to come to, come to uh, pass. Could someone read, please? But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of, the, of deep darkness, on them has light shined. Uh, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy in the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the, sh and the staff of his shoulder, or for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampering warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood, will be burned as fuel for the fire. Okay, thanks, Mike. Now, there's a lot of images in here and trying to unpack this. Uh, yes, Veronica. Just real quick, I'm not sure that it matters too much, but I have a, uh, the NASB, and I'm wondering if the verb tense is in the Hebrew, because mine is all future. Like, it's saying, this is the prediction, will see a great light, uh, will shine on them, Shall multiply. It, that, that's actually that, that's a very that's a good ear you've got there and a good eye because they're they're in, in Hebrew they're actually they're perfect tenses uh, and yet they're you know and, and kind of taken as a prophetic uh, uh, you know have seen has dawned uh, but they mean will see okay. will dawn. Okay. I mean it's so it's a prophetic word and it's again even the language out there of. of you know, uh, chapter nine, verse one, about the former time. Okay, so something that happened in the in the past, and then now there's in distinguishing from that is the latter time, which is is kind of just beginning, and with their return then, you know, from captivity. But that's just a, the the first, you know, kind of you know, uh, you know flash of fulfillment because the the full fullness is coming when this guy Jesus of Nazareth is moving from Nazareth to Capernaum. He is the light. I mean, that's the identification here. You know, if you are dwelling in, in darkness, uh, uh, you've seen a great light. You know, the, uh, the folks who are without God uh, uh, and who are in captivity, who are deported away, wait a second. God has entered again. We're living in this, you know, anguish and distress, all those, all those uh, descriptor words there. But now, you know, the people who walked in darkness, you know, hey, that was us, you know, there's this great light in view. Uh, we were uh, taken away from our own land, and uh, we dwelt for a, a time of exile in a land of deep darkness, and my gosh, the light has come. God made a promise and is keeping the promise. The, uh, 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 again, I mean, and, and you see the, the, the verses 2 and 3, I think, are the ones that uh, Matthew uh, uh, especially quotes here. But like we've been saying over and over again, even if Matthew just quotes two verses from Isaiah chapter 9, you want to know the, that whole little uh, cutting of the text. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 7, which thankfully is kind of familiar to us because 
You, you, you'll hear it sometimes on Christmas Eve or, or Christmas Day as one of the readings. Uh, but uh, this is just astonishing, you know, for the, for the people in the time of Isaiah, the first hearers of this, you know, after what they have experienced with, you know, loss to the uh, uh, Assyrian conquest, and now all this time has passed, and now the, the, the preacher, Isaiah, using the words that God gives, says, light is coming. And he's going to define that even more when he says, a child is coming, a son is being given, and wait till you get a load of who this child is. Is this how God is going to come as a, as a child? Well, yeah. Do, would you and I maybe have better ideas about how God should come? Well, we could probably put our heads together and think of lots of better ideas than the, the way God is chosen. But this is the way God is chosen. A son is given, a child is born, and then all these descriptors that we'll get to here in, in just a little bit. But uh, 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 here again, the, uh, in verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 9, you, you have the, 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 the life of these people coming back, kind of described as, you know, but you've been conquered as a nation, but now you're going to be multiplied. What does that mean? You're going to thrive. You're going to you know, abundance, increase, all of these things. Uh, you know, where you had just had the, the sorrow and the, uh, the, the tragedy of the, the exile and life as, as uh, in, enslaved captives. But now, you know, your joy is going to be increased. Uh, uh, it's like, uh, and anybody grow up on a farm? You know, what, what, what is your assessment as you look back and uh, uh, when you talk about harvest time? It was a busy time. It was a busy time, and then when it finally... It on the weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, as, as somebody who grew up in, you know, the suburbs of Chicago, and the only cow I saw was at the, the 4-H fair of Cook County, and I uh, actually got swatted in the face one time by a, a cow's tail. It was pretty kind of traumatic, but I'm better now. And, uh, uh, but then uh, being a pastor for, uh, uh, for five years in northeast Nebraska, and, uh, you know, seeing how everything rotates, I mean... The harvest and uh, you know the, the ups and downs of good weather or you know, good years and, and bad years and and uh, uh, increases and, and uh, gee this is you know too much water in the field we can't get in at the right time but the harvest when you had this focal point of, of work and effort and uh, you know and, and when it's done time. what's what's the what's the sense there it's it's joy we're a bunch we're a little bit more urban folks so we haven't uh, made our living off the land or have much of an experience with that but the idea uh, in, in verse 3 when it says uh, uh, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest I mean they're saying this is full out you know joyous time I mean when everything is uh, you know dependent upon <laughs> your survival with the crops from from one year to the next and will we have enough will be will be Will we, will we be prosperous again? We'll, we'll rejoice like at, the, like at a good harvest. We'll, be, we'll live with enough and we'll be satisfied. This is what is being promised by Isaiah to the people who are, who've now come out of this, you know, this deportation, the loss of everything. They saw the loss of their homes, but now they're making their way back uh, uh, by the way of the sea, you know, from that, that road from Damascus on to the, to the uh, they're, they're returning to where their homes were, uh, the land uh, beyond the Jordan, on, on this side of the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say that one of the things that I, it, uh, I can easily see why this is one of the great reference verses for uh, that God, uh, the Lord, will put give his gospel to the Gentiles also. Uh, and because it's like, it isn't just, they're not just multiplied in the sense of the number of Jews returning to the land, but who's returning there with them, you know, uh, Every garment rolled in blood, you know, I picture the enemy soldier who slaughtered the blood, killed, the, killed all these Jews that, in, in the process of conquering them. He's going to roll those clothes up and throw them in the fire because they just, is it necessary anymore. It's not being held against him. And like the returning Jew, he is coming to uh, this, this land. Why? On because of the child. It's, I, uh, am I reading too much into this? Well, well, we'll get a little bit more to that when we get to verses 6 and 7. But the idea that, this, that the Gentiles figure in this 
I mean, this is, you know, the God of Israel, you know, with the, the prophet Isaiah, you know, uh, preaching to God's people, Israel. And yet the reference points here are about, well, you know, the nations are there. You know, the foreigners are there. They, you've come out of this uh, Assyrian captivity. You're coming back to a region which was kind of so thick with the Gentiles that we call it Gentile, the Galilee of the Gentiles. You know, Zebulun and Naphtali and the other locations there. And this is where, I mean, this is I mean, kind of a, a nice subtext where you're going, Davis, about uh, this you know, very region of you know, Palestine is uh, the place where Jesus, you know, he does, he does stuff down here. And he dies down here, and he's risen down here. And yet, all of this time, in this kind of dirty, <coughs> Gentile region, mixing it up with people who aren't like us, yet for whom he has come. And this, you know, this is the place, if you just line up all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the Gentile ministry of Jesus and uh, you know, uh, changing water into wine and Cana up there uh, for his first miracle. I mean, he does his first miracle there. Not, you know, you know, in downtown Jerusalem, but in Cana, which is part of the, you know, you know, the Galilee of the Gentiles there, the old Zebulun and Naphtali tribal areas. But, you know, the healing of the centurion servant, uh, the paralytic Peter's mother-in-law, Capernaum, uh, where he's moving to, the, the, the raising of Jairus' daughter, a, a resurrection. I mean, the son of God, the son who is given, the child who is born, begins his ministry and his restoration uh, of a broken creation, whether he's changing water into wine with great abundance or raising a dead girl up there. Wasn't you know, that, uh, also not the place you would expect him to be. And of course, you know, when his, his uh, preaching in the synagogue there, uh, uh, or even delivering uh, where the, I can't remember where the, where the Sermon on the Mount, I believe that, yeah, that would be up there too, because Matthew chapter 5 follows Matthew chapter 4. In, I was going um, to ask, everybody's Bible. isn't this also the uh, area, of, uh, I think it was Gennesaret, remember the demon-possessed man who lived in, in the graveyard and people would try to catch him and he was just overpowered? <coughs> Wasn't that up in this area too? Um, I, I'd have to hunt that down. Maybe you can find where that's at. I'm, I'm, I, I can't remember specifically where that, where that arises, but wouldn't, I mean, uh, they were folks who were kind of bummed to lose their pigs. <laughs> and uh, 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 and I mean, if if, the, if those were Jews who were losing their pigs, they were not very good. They were not very good Jews. But again, this you know this mingling in and 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 a gospel that you know from Matthew's gospel. I mean, the very you know, what we often call the, the the great commission. You know, therefore go make disciples of all nations. all nations. And here's Jesus as he begins his ministry, right there where you know where all the other people are. You know, I, and, who, and though he'll say, I, I was sent first to the lost sheep of Israel. But boy, great is your faith, O oh, Syrophoenician woman. You know, when she uh, 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 prays for mercy for her, uh, for her demon-possessed daughter. But uh, the reference there to this, uh, the military, you know, coming out of this uh, uh, military destruction with it, that, that, that hauled them all off to uh, 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 uh Assyria, and that language there, you know, of, of kind of captivity or enslavement, uh, verse 4, you know, uh, you guys had a, the, the yoke of his burden. Would you rather have a yoke on you or not have a yoke on you? Probably not have a yoke on you. Yokes kind of re, uh, uh, restrain you. They keep you from doing what you want to do, and rather the master will, who yokes you will then drive you where he wants to, or the, uh, the staff for his shoulder, the idea, you know, the, the staff used kind of for, for hitting and slapping. You don't like that. But when you were in captivity, when you were uh, uh, in Assyria and, and Babylon, uh, and the rod of his oppressor that's used to, to, to strike people. Uh, but that yoke, that staff, that rod, you, oh God, have, have broken so that, that past uh, uh, military defeat and uh, uh, becoming captive, that's gone. And here's another nice Old Testament reference. You know, you could buy, buy, bypass this and not give too much pause. But when he says in verse 4, uh, you have broken, you know, this great light is coming. And this is, you know, the, the harvest is, it's like a great harvest is coming. It's like we just won the battle and, and we got the spoil now. And, and we get to divide the spoil and our oppressor has been defeated. You have broken his uh, rod uh, as on the day of Midian. 
So what's that about? What's, what's Midian? Moses' victory. Moses' victory uh, when he raises, kept his hand raised above it. They, isn't that? Uh, Mid, it's no, Gideon. That Amalek. Midian is Gideon. And is it? Moses was from the land of Midian. Uh, yeah, I think, and his wife, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there are some, yeah, there are some, no, uh, but the, the great battle there is uh, in the book of Judges. Uh, this is kind of fun because I see where the, the two different uh, uh, Bible studies we're doing with the angels and demons. We've been talking about the angel of the Lord who appears to Gideon, kind of at the beginning of the call of Gideon, uh, when the Midianites had kind of taken over and uh, because... Uh, the Israelites did what was uh, uh, bad in the sight of the Lord. Uh, then they cry out for deliverance. It's kind of the, the, the litany and the echo you hear continually through the book of well, Judges and, and throughout the Old Testament. Uh, uh, God's people uh, uh, cry out for deliverance. God sends them uh, a deliverer, a savior. Uh, they say, we will do what the Lord says. And then 24 hours later, they're, you know, uh, checking out some other new uh, uh, false god or following their passion someplace else. And then you kind of repeat the cycle you know, over and over again. And don't get too cocky because it's kind of a description of ourselves as well. But uh, uh, this idea that uh, Gideon, it was, this is a, what Judges chapter, what, like six and seven? seven and, uh, and Gideon, this is kind of cool too, because what tribe, I, I only know this because I was looking at it the other day, but what tribe was Gideon from when the Lord, the angel of the Lord calls him and says, hey, man of valor, you know, go, uh, I'm going to set you in, uh, against these Midianites so you'll, you'll free your people. Gideon was of the tribe of Benjamin, wasn't it? Tribe of Manasseh. Oh. And uh, so it's funny because you got, uh, and, and in fact, he tries to downplay it. He goes, man, I, you know, I'm from one of the lesser tribes, and, and uh, I, I'm from one of the weaker clans within Manasseh. You know, I'm not the guy you want. It sounds like Moses saying, uh, I'm, I'm not the one that should be, you know, going to get the, uh, uh, the, the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, maybe send somebody else. He goes, no, no, I'll, I'll send you with your brother. Uh, Aaron's, Aaron talks good. He'll, uh, you can uh, bring him with. But, uh, uh, and there, what is the, I mean, there's other things that go on with Gideon, and there's all these flawed, flawed uh, characters uh, in uh, God's redemptive history here, but uh, uh, what is the great, when you think of your kind of, your basic number one Gideon Sunday school story, uh, the defeat of the Midianites, what's the, what's the little narrative of that, of that victory, of that military victory of, of uh, God's? Was it about the fleas? Yeah, the fleece. Well, there, there, there was, I mean, he, he has to get his, uh, his mighty army. How big is Gideon's mighty army? Oh, this is the one where he, he <laughs> 300. says. It's pretty tiny. He, he so starts out big. He sends so many people to drink from the water. Yeah. Those that laugh like dogs. And if you drink the way I drink, you're one of the 300. <laughs> kind of, those people, you using your hands, come on. You're not fooling anybody. But, uh. Uh, uh, you know, again with this small force against this mighty Midian force. Remember, they, I still remember one of the, uh, whatever the uh, Concordia Publishing House drawings, you know, color drawings with the, must have been on the, the, uh, 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 the Sunday School Bulletin picture, the really nice art of the, uh, of the, the, the followers of Gideon, and they've got their, uh, uh, the light. Uh, in the kind of hidden away in their in the jars and stuff and then they break open the jars and the Midianites are caught up in this confusion uh, just against 300 of the followers of Gideon and they win this great victory and Gideon is you know he, he, he becomes a man of valor that he did not think he would be he doesn't have any of the skills himself but God makes use of him and uh, they win a victory in uh, in the book of Judges so that's kind of the idea of uh, that you know just like God broke them on the day of Midian uh, uh, when they, uh, uh, you know, going back to real history, the, the Judges chapter six and seven, and this whole idea of uh, the, the tramping warrior and battle tumult, when you come out of a, uh, I think it's probably difficult for us to understand how, I mean, war is terrible at any level. Uh, there's sometimes a more sanitary way of, you know, we can send drones and, you know, hit a button, you know, 14,000 miles away and, and launch a, launch a missile. Uh, in, in the old days, it was much more up close. And the, the horror of that, or living through the horror, or having a house that observes the horror in your front yard as you know people go to battle against each other, and you are covered with blood and the gore. I mean, this is just another uh, 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 situation that we have no familiarity with, thanks be to God, just like many of us 
don't know what the harvest joy is like. And the harvest joy is quite considerable, uh, as, as Karen can tell you. But uh, that, uh, you know, these garments rolled in blood, they're just stained completely through. They are not just unclean, like dirty, you know, but with all that blood and death, they're unclean, unclean. You know, not able to be, uh, you know, they must, something must be done in order to make them holy, to bring us back to God. Uh, they're going to be burned as fuel for the fire. They're going to be gone. All that conflict, all that, the, uh, uh, the, the military activity that had been part of the past, that is, as, as we're looking forward to the fulfillment and this light coming into this place of gloom and uh, uh, you know, the, the light coming into this place of darkness. And as we'll see in a moment here, a child is being born. A son is being given. That's the, you know, when you want to know who the, this light isn't in it, as if I just flip a switch and, oh, now it's brighter. Oh, it's so much nicer. I can see everybody. That's nice to have light. You know, this light that breaks in already there in Zebulun and Naphtali when the Israelites are coming out of captivity. Well, this light is on full blast now with this man, Jesus of Nazareth who is the one who is this child born, this son that is giving. Uh, could someone read, uh, we'll just read verses, those last two verses, six and seven, please. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Here is the reason. I, I, you know, you've heard this so many times. And there's maybe always a detail or two that you're not always tracking with. And then you hear something like, well, to us a child is born. Oh, Christmas. For unto us a son is given, and uh, the government shall be upon his shoulder. He, you know, he rules. Maybe not in a way in which we manifestly see in an obvious way, the way we think, well, uh, 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 you know, the dictator rules, or the, the president rules, or the, the parliament rules, or the congress rules, the way we see the nations unfolding over history. But th there's a government, and it's, it's on him. And, uh, uh, and he's given a name, these, these familiar uh, names that we sing in the Ungamak, uh, uh, different translations, but, you know, wonder, an absolute wonder, wonderful. Uh, counselor, a name we often associate with which person of the Holy Trinity? Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, it, this is interesting. In fact, there's a there's a there's a Trinitarian uh, win here, because although they're talking about the Son, the Child, that's that's Jesus. He is the Light, and He is the Light of the world. But even these other names that are associated, that by which He is called and identified, when we think of, uh, 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 we don't think of Him as. Uh, Everlasting Father, right? Well, who do we think of as the Father? But the, the first person of the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God Most High. There's different ways of uh, recognizing him. And it, there's a, a bit of a blur here that Jesus, can Jesus identify with the Father? I and the Father are one. Are one. And is Jesus also a, you know, what's the, uh, what's the Greek word? We'll see how good you are because it's in one of our hymns that uh, is often translated as counselor. Paraclete. Paraclete, yeah. This, uh, uh, and it's sometimes, you know, comforter, counselor, uh, and it's usually associated with the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus also is that, you know, that advocate for us. So there's, it's, you kind of see, you know, although this is about the Son who is given, it also brings into light the, the work of the Holy Spirit and the terms we often associate with the Holy Spirit, which is... You know, the, that he, uh, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit is the counselor, the, that uh, God the Father is uh, the everlasting Father. And yet this is, you know, three persons, which we make distinctions between the three persons, and yet one God. But we don't make, you know, we always distinguish the persons, but always speak of the one God who is at work for us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for, for us and for our salvation. And uh, uh, even the terms here, this is... Uh, uh, you know, it, this, this reading in Isaiah kind of began with the metaphor of light. You know, the light comes into the darkness, into the gloom. Good. 
And, and here again, that's, that's probably, with our culture, is it ever really completely dark around here? No. <laughs> Not, Not really. No, I mean, and, and, and this is what would be frightening if we were all, you know, you know settlers on the, uh, uh, on the, you know, making our way west when, uh, when there's no moon out. You know, when dark is dark, and you got fire for a while, but then if that goes out, then boy, it's really dark. I have been, uh, when I did a little uh, 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 sleeping outside as, uh, as a, uh, in the uh, part of the armed forces as a chaplain, I remember being under heavy tree cover uh, <laughs> at some night, and we, you couldn't use any flashlights. You don't, you know, you had to have complete uh, light discipline, meaning if anybody saw a flash of light or you're smoking a cigarette, you're going to get into big trouble. But, you know, when you would step out of your tent, as sometimes you have to get up in the middle of the night to step out of your tent, and you want to step away from your tent when you have to get up in the middle of the night to step away from your tent. And it was, you better know which direction you're going. And sometimes it is so dark. You know, I, I've spent a couple of hours, I don't know, which way am I facing? If I head off that way, you know, I'm walking away from where I want to end up in my nice, cool uh, uh, hooch here, my, my sleeping bag. But, uh, uh, but if I kind of remember, if I tie a string, I never had to do that. But uh, I mean, and, and as someone who doesn't have great vision, I understand darkness pretty well. And I, have to, I can get dressed when it's completely dark. I just know where things are. Uh, unless you come in and move them, then, then, uh, then I'm in trouble. But uh, that idea of light coming for them, th th in that culture, they would truly understand yeah, it would be a source of even greater joy, like the harvest, like this great, you know, military victory or the, or the end of all wars. And what is the reason for the, the great harvest or the joy at the harvest and the great light and the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the breaking of the oppressor? It's a baby. It's a child. It's a, it's a human. But this human is spoken of quite explicitly as, as you see in the middle of verse 6, mighty God. I mean, this is and was in the mind of uh, every faithful Jew who delighted in this promise. This is the, this is the Messiah. And all of these terms that, uh, uh, you know, we, we began with the, the kind of the, the metaphor of light. Uh, uh, it kind of ends with the birth of Jesus. Merry Christmas. Again, going back to this child. And again, the idea that you know, if I'm looking for a savior, a mighty or a mighty man of valor, valor, a redeemer, uh, you know, a fighter, a warrior who is going to take my part and defeat the enemy, I'm not looking first, you know, at the cribs, at the the, the little ones, the baby or the child. And yet, Isaiah preaches by virtue of the words given to him. Here's the reason for our. Here's the, here's the light. Here's the reason for our joy to us. And even that, you know, the, uh, and that, it, that it's repeated. You know, that we, we talk about how you repeat things for emphasis. You repeat things for emphasis. Did you see what I did there? For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And, uh, you know, so it, for us, those little words, you know, Lutherans love those words, you know, because it's, for me, for, for our benefit, for our sake. One goes in my place. You know, the great exchange, you know, God receives all of my sin and takes it unto death. And I receive from him, you know, I give him your sin and death, Lord. And he gives to me, confers to me his righteousness, his purity, his cleanness, his holiness, so that they are, that they are mine. What was mine is given to him. What is his is given to me, his righteousness, his innocence, his blessedness. And through a, a child, a son, given, again, that great gifting word, the government upon his shoulder, and these uh, marvelous names that kind of, uh, uh, you know, even though he's a baby, you know, even though he's a, a son, uh, a child that is born, uh, his name shall be called, and then, you know, uh, uh, get down the, uh, uh, get your paper and pencil, because there's a whole bunch of names that go with this child. He's wonderful, counselor. He's uh, uh, the mighty God. Now, when I think, I, I have never looked at a, a, an infant and thought, ah, that infant is mighty. I would never look at an infant and think, oh, that infant is is God. But that's precisely what Isaiah says here, that this child 
is mighty. I don't associate that with an infant. And he's God. I wouldn't associate that with an infant unless I also knew what the sign that uh, uh, the Lord gave to Ahaz back in Isaiah chapter 7. About kids again, going back to these children that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He will save his people from their sins. God with us. And so this, this, I mean, it really is extraordinary. I mean, again, the, the, the idea that we, we hear this so commonly and often, sometimes the, 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 the full thrust of the words uh, doesn't hit us about the way, hit us about the head the way that uh, they, they really are meant to. You know, this, he's a child, but he's going to be a, a king. He's, he's an infant, but he's powerful. He's mighty God. Even if uh, Mary and Joseph have to sweep him up and, and go down to Egypt for a while to uh, uh, protect him from uh, uh, evil King Herod. But, uh, uh, and he and his kingdom are going to be eternal. Look at the language here uh, in verse 7. Uh, of the increase of his government of pe- and of peace, there will be no end. I think in terms of ends or when things stop or cease. You know, like I'm really looking forward to the end of like, you know, the, the, the COVID issue. But here's a kingdom with this child and the, the man that he is, the mighty God that he is, who is wonderful and uh, a bringer of peace, the prince of peace. And there's no end to him. And in fact, he's uh, in line. He's on the throne of his father, David. And again, that brings in another strain of this, you know, the the certainty of this promise. It's going to be the uh, Old Testament reading this coming Sunday, the fourth Sunday in Advent, where uh, uh, when uh, David wants to build a house for God, for the Lord, for Yahweh. And at first, uh, you know, Nathan says, oh, I think that's okay. And then the Lord says to Nathan, nope, not going to do that. The Lord says, I'm going to build you a house and uh, your, uh, your offspring on the throne. Uh, you, David, of, uh, of little, little Bethlehem, taken out of the, the, uh, the care for sheep, uh, who becomes king of, uh, of God's people. Uh, the throne of David over his kingdom uh, to establish it and to uphold it with justice. He is concerned with justice and, and the law, the rule of law. Maybe you could see, you know, in our Lutheran terms, law and gospel there, where it says uh, uh, at the end of verse 7, with justice and with righteousness. That, where that righteousness is that conferred righteousness, where you have been bespoken righteous. I mean, your sins are forgiven. He is a God of justice, so sin must be punished. And he is a God of righteousness, where he gives what is his, which is an attribute of, of, of him, his perfect righteousness. And he confers it, he bespeaks it. He gives it to you by removing your sin and by removing your death. Uh, and here's more language of uh, from this time, going forward, and forevermore. He is the everlasting Father. There will be no end to his kingdom. Uh, it'll be from this time forth and forevermore. And then that very last phrase there, the zeal of the Lord, the good kind of zeal. And the zeal of Yahweh, right? And here again, maybe we can see the, 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 the Father, as being the one who's, he's going to give the son, he's going to give this, the, the child who is uh, born, the, the son who is given, uh, born of this woman, uh, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Nothing stops this deliverance. And, as, uh, and there's kind of this twofold uh, uh, fulfillment of this. Remember, it's, it's, you know, the people of Isaiah's day hearing, coming out of their captivity and going back home. Galilee of the Gentiles, glad to be back. So that's a joy for them, out of captivity. But even within that, that's just a, a, a beginning whiff of this true light that is coming. And they'll have to wait for it. It'll happen in God's time, in the fullness of time. And as Matthew tells us, here's what Isaiah, when, he, when he's talking about the son that's going to be given, the child that is born, it's this Jesus who, yeah, he's the guy who is moving from Nazareth now to Capernaum. And then he began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he picks his disciples, and he, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the rest of the gospel there. Yes, Jane? The zeal of the Lord. It'd be interesting to look up in the dictionary the meaning of the word 
zeal. Because you just can't, I just can't think of the zeal of the Lord. Well, I mean, the, the, I mean, the great, uh, you know, unstoppable excitation that, that he is going to, you know, what he has promised, he is going to do, and he's joyous to do it. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I guess there can be, you know, positive and negative connotations to the word zeal. I mean, the word zealot, you know, if you're called a zealot for a cause, sometimes it's not meant as a, as a compliment. Uh, the zealots in the, you know, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, Simon, one of the disciples, is part of a, a kind of a political party, uh, which which sometimes might use a little violence if they need it against the Romans, the the zealots. Uh, so there's different connotations with that. But here, you know, uh, just as uh, uh, when we speak of uh, uh, the Lord our God as a jealous God, jealousy is bad for you and me. But when it describes the Lord God, our God, it means. Well, he, he is God and no one else is. And he will not allow any other God to be God because there is no other God but him. And so he is jealous for his people. He is, and he is zealous to do, you know, the zeal of the Lord will do exactly what he's promised to do. There's and there he is. What's that? I feel a certain intensity. Oh, you know, absolutely. Although it may not look, you know, well, I, I see a, a child and a son. That doesn't necessarily look so intense. I see uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, didn't he, uh, you know, grow up down the street there in Nazareth, and he's making his move now to uh, 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 to, to Capernaum to, to kind of kick into the ministry, the public ministry, you know? But it, that is the Lord's zeal at work because He is fulfilling His promise, which Isaiah lays out quite marvelously for the us. The Lord here. of Hosts does that angel armies. Um, yeah, I mean, hosts is often that, uh, you know, Lord God of Sabaoth, uh, the Lord God of hosts, the, you know, armies upon armies, the, 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 heavenly, the heavenly realm. Yeah, it's, uh, that would be, I think, a reference to uh, the angelic uh, company that uh, always accompany, accompany God. But uh, so here, you know, the, the Lord promises and is delivering this, this everlasting kingdom, uh, uh, which, and he's fulfilling a promise that he made to David, promise kept. He's fulfilling the promise he made to uh, 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 Isaiah you know, for Ahaz, you know, uh, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a child, uh, God, God with us. Uh, uh, and so uh, it's kind of nice that we were able to do this on, these, uh, on our, our last session here before the, uh, uh, for our little uh, Christmas uh, downtime here, but uh, uh, any other any other comments or questions here as we kind of we'll, uh, okay. Well, that was fun. The place we're going to go to next is uh, uh, and this is a nice overlap. <coughs> if you uh, were at the noon service or you come to the six thirty p.m. divine service, our uh, our own Matt Mockaber, who is uh, also in the uh, M Div. Uh, program is our preacher tonight. He's preaching on the uh, he's preaching on the Old Testament reading, Isaiah 61. And Isaiah 61 uh, is actually the next place we'll be going. Uh, uh, and he makes reference to this because uh, the very first time Jesus, uh, when he gives his kind of inaugural sermon uh, or uh, inaugurating his ministry from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the on, the on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, when he gets up to read the Isaiah scroll, he reads Isaiah 61. We know this from Luke chapter four, and uh, that's where we'll spend some time because it kind of lays out the whole program of what the Messiah has come to do. And this is the one where he says, "This is fulfilled in your hearing," and so it's here. And he's taken it from Isaiah, you know, uh, many many centuries before, but they're present in that place. Uh, coming from that mouth, uh, and the people are all kind of amazed. Of course, they want to throw him off the edge of a cliff there not too long after. But uh, that's, a, that's a, the, the threats that go along with preaching sometimes. But uh, why don't we uh, we'll, um, shut off the camera here. We'll do our prayers. January 6th will be our next uh, gathering, Wednesday, January 6th, Epiphany.